exalt you, God. And God, we don't want to just exalt you because we're in the building singing songs. God, we want our hearts to be pure in exaltation that you are supreme, that our highest priority, God, is serving and loving you. That you hold us, oh God, and we stand in awe of an awesome God who could throw us into a black universe and yet you choose to share your love with us and your spirit. God, I ask this morning that you would cause us to tremble at your voice. That we would be awed, oh God, that the ground we stand on, God, because of presence is holy. God, that never would we become to the place where we would be satisfied that we have enough of you. But God, there's always a desire to say, come closer, oh God, and I want to come closer to you. God, we thank you that you've given us the instruction of your word. We're thankful, God, that you minister it to us through your Holy Spirit. But God, help us to have receptive ears, eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that understand. Riches of your grace to us. The very voice of God speaking into our hearts to convince our minds not only are you say who you are, but that we can become like you in spirit. Oh, Father, help us to tremble at your voice and at your word. exaltation be pure. May it not be clouded by other decisions I make. May it not be clouded by other things that I think, but God, that I really do place you in the highest place. God, that you don't have rivals in my life. That I don't have to step around my idols to come to you. there would be a purity in my life, oh God, to love you and to serve you with everything. We bless you, God. We bless you. Thank you that you give us this time. Thank you that you give us music that ministers our soul to you. Thank you that you've designed the soul to respond to worship. Thank you, God, that it opens up our mind to understand you more. It's all your design. We can't do it ourselves. We can just say thank you. And we do say that this morning. We bless you. Spirit of God, open our hearts to your voice. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Don't you just love it? I encourage you to stay in it. We might be done singing, but his word is the essence of his kingdom. Let's keep our ears open the same way that we do in our music ministry. Because I want to I want to share some things with you this morning and this is going to be very straightforward and probably long, I warn you. But I want to talk to you this morning about kingdom power. Do you remember when Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And then he asked them, who do you say that I am? And they said, thou art the Christ. And he said, flesh and blood is not revealed to you. And then he says, and upon this rock, I build my church, and I give you keys to the kingdom. 
right? You know that part? You see, I believe that there are places in the kingdom that are given to us by instruction. And then I believe that there are keys to the kingdom that come through observation in the word. And you have to dig for them. And you have to study them. And you have to put them together. And then you can understand it better. I spoke two weeks ago about presence and how vital the presence of God is in our lives. And I will tell you, there's no shortcut to presence. Presence is, is something that is immeasurable by someone else in your life. Only you know the true essence of the presence of God in your life. And I will tell you that I know that in this area where we live, this region that we live, so many people are brought up in religion. And with a religious background, I will tell you this, it's hard to fathom presence because we've been so conditioned in performance. You have to purposely come into the presence of God. And how do you do that? You have to steal yourself to other voices. You have to own his word. And you have to make him, by his spirit, the voice that is the loudest in your life. That doesn't happen naturally. That comes supernaturally. I'm going to use a lot of observations today, and that's why we're going to go on a long journey through the Word. Because I don't want to tell you about it, I want to show you what it says. I'm not the authority, it is. I'm an observer. And when I can put things together through observation, then it should be the convincing of our hearts. Because I will tell you this, there's lots of voices out there that are going to say a hundred different things, and you have to figure out who you're going to trust. And the first thing you do in trusting a voice is bring it back to the Word. In understanding the power of God, I want to first tell you that it's purchased. If you would, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 4, verse 14. I will tell you what that is about on your journey there to get to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 talks about Jesus coming into this place and Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And he fasted for 40 days. He separated himself from all of the things that the flesh would call necessary. Food, people, the relationships, schedule, all of those things he separated himself from so that he could come into this place and then, I mean, look, Jesus, Jesus was a God-man, but he had to learn his humanity. His humanity was not natural to him. He had to learn the limitations of his humanity. And that's why the, the word declares that though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. And so you, you understand that Jesus being perfect in spirit was put into a position like us. We have to learn as spirit beings once we're born again how to deal with our flesh man. We have to reprioritize how this is going to work in our lives. It's not easy, and it's not natural. It has to be purchased. And Jesus was baptized right before Luke chapter 4. He went down into the water, baptized by John. When he was there, the Spirit, I mean, God the Father spoke and thundered over him and said, this is my beloved Son. The Spirit, it says, came bodily upon him. Because he had put himself in position to be impacted by the Spirit of God. He purchased the anointing of the power of God through his 
perfect willingness to walk into the trial that God had put him in to make sure that he was going to walk in obedience. You purchase this. Then it says this in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus, after it was finished, returned in the power of the Spirit. If you look in the first part of Luke chapter 4, it, it says that he went in filled with the Spirit and he came out in the power of the Spirit. To me, that's key. That's an observation. And it's one observation, so don't put a lot of stock in that. Because you can observe a lot of things one time in Scripture, but you dare not make a doctrine out of it unless you can find other places that verify and do what it says. Does that make sense to you? One chapter later, I want to talk to you a little bit about the difference between the power of God and the presence of God and how the purchase works. But I also want you to understand, and I, I, believe me, I'll cover this, but I, I, so you won't be left hanging. So if we go you know, around the barn a little bit, we will arrive at the door. Luke 5, 17. Let me move my mic up a little bit. Might make it a little clearer. It says this, And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, Jesus that is, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now what do you make out of that passage? That power word is what we're dealing with today, and that's dunamis. There are two words, there are a couple more, but barely used in the New Testament. The main two words that you see in uh, the New Testament in Greek for power is exousia. We talked about that two weeks ago. That is interpreted as authority. Then you have this word dunamis, which is the supernatural power of God that does things that humans can't do. And today, I want to talk about the dunamis power of God. But the dunamis has to work in people who have learned how to walk in exousia. This will make sense in a little bit. Might be Greek to you right now. But it says that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. What does that sound like to you? I'm not going to ask you to answer. What I'm going to tell you is what I believe it is. I believe that Jesus, because he had been put into position with the understanding of the kingdom, could perceive that among this people, the power of God wanted to do something, and he could hear it in the voice of the Spirit speaking to him and saying, here, I'm ready to do and show you the power of God among this people it would seem that in our day we measure our spirituality more by performance than presence but I will tell you this fellow believer the performance that comes to our lives without presence will fall short and it will cause us to feel even hypocritical in our lives because presence is what gives us position. Jesus didn't come so we could just be clean sinners. Jesus came to make us overcomers. There's a story in Luke chapter 5, and you're familiar with it. You don't have to turn there. I will be using verse 24 because it's a demonstration of something, and this is the story where they couldn't get close to Jesus, and so they took this, this man who could not walk up on the roof and opened up the roof and set him down through, 
And Jesus knew that the Pharisees were outside and knew the crowd that was gathered and knew because of the press of the people he, they couldn't get in. And when he saw them do it, he talked about them, uh, you know, that it was by their faith. And, and, and so they let this man down in front of him. And if you've seen The Chosen, you, you see the remarkableness of this story in a really good way. And this man was let down right in front of Jesus. And Jesus spoke to this man and said, Son, thy sins be forgiven. I love that. Because you know what the word declares is that he will use the wisdom of God to confound the wisdom of this world. And the Pharisees were operating in the wisdom of this world and they held power simply by their prestige and position. But it wasn't the power of God. And God, in wanting to show them the real power of God, knows that you have to work through authority. And so what he said was, thy sins be forgiven. And knowing their thoughts, he immediately turned to the Pharisees who were talking among themselves by saying, by what authority? Authority forgives sins, by the way. By what authority does this man forgive sins? Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said that you may, which is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven or take up thy bed and walk? And of course, the answer is, it's easier to say your sins be forgiven. Nobody can tell if it happened. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on the earth to forgive sins. I say, man, take up your bed and walk. And the man got up and walked out of there carrying his bed. Now, you know that story. But you see, we, what we don't understand is the, uh, the authority that comes, exousia comes, by spending the time in the presence of God and knowing who I am in God so that when he wants to work power through me, I'm not showing off, I'm glorifying him. There's a lot of showing off in the Christian circles today. We want to slap them on the head and make it look like we can make them fall down. Anybody can make somebody fall down. Do they have a divine visitation from God by the time they get up? That's going to be the question. Do we understand what the presence of God actually means? I want to tell you this prayer initiative, it's, it's easy to get up here today. Anybody would want to preach on this day because people have spent three days praying in this building on the other end and they've prepared the ground. There's been a spiritual work that's going on in this place. Can't see it, but that's what's being done. And there's a work that God wants to do in this world, but it's going to take people who are familiar with his presence and know who he is, and know who they are because of that, that then when it comes time, they can say, hey, man, take up your bed and walk, and people will marvel and go, what? But too many times we see a bed, and we just think it'd be cool. We haven't heard from God. We haven't been in his presence. We just think it'd be cool. So we pray and wonder why they don't get up. These are my observations. Exousia, the authority of a Christian, is the position that we are to be found in as children of God. But I will just tell you right now, because you pray a prayer doesn't give you that position. It gives you the ability to come into that position. Because now you have the divine interpreter on the inside of you. But if you think it's just a download and he's gonna just give you all the scripture that you need on the inside of you without you getting into the scripture and owning it for yourself, you're missing the point. There's people out there trying to do all kinds of work and they couldn't quote five verses to you. They don't own the word, they don't know the word, and they don't know the kingdom, but they know that they're like Simon the sorcerer and they want to see something happen and so they get busy trying to make it happen. That's not the power of God. The power of God is purchased. Purchased. 
Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 4. I'm going to read 4 through 6 here because I want you to understand that God does position us. I'm not talking anybody out of who they are in Christ. Please understand that. But in this day, I will tell you, we're cheapening the way that God's working in people's lives, and you can't do that. What, what did Jesus say when his mom talked to him at a certain wedding? He had been through the rest of this stuff. He had been baptized. And yet he said, my time has not yet come. What was he waiting on? He still hadn't found that the power that he knew was going to come upon him felt like it was upon him. And yet we read that he returned out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. It takes somebody time to come into the understanding of what that power is actually going to do in their lives. It's more than speaking in tongues. He didn't say, tarry in Jerusalem until you speak in tongues. He said, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. There is to be, and that's dunamis. There's something that's supposed to happen to the believer. And I don't care who poo-poos it. It's the word. I don't care what your background is. It's the word. Tongue seems to be a good evidence of his power in your life. But just because you're speaking in tongues, you can mimic people if you want to. You've got to know that the power resides in you that was brought on the day of Pentecost and is available to anybody that believes. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 says this in verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Let me just interject right there. And by grace you continue to be saved. Because grace is the divine power of God. And we're not there yet. And he hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is the spiritual position that you attain when you are born of the Spirit of God. That's not up for debate. I'm not debating that this morning. You are seated with Christ. But what you have to do is you have to learn how in your flesh to become like him and know and trust that position of authority that you now possess. Because it's not natural, it's supernatural. Does that make sense to you? You see, this is where I think the choking point of much of the church is. We act like when you pray the prayer, everything needs to be done, it's done. It's done. And you're going, no, all you can do, you just made an introduction into a kingdom that is completely unnatural to you. Now you have to study to show yourself approved. Now you have to learn how to trust him so that when he speaks, you hear him and not your own mind. You have to learn how to operate in a kingdom that has power that this world never had. And that's not natural. But when you can walk in a place and with the presence of God on the inside of you and the spirit of God speaks to you and says, I want you to pray for that one because I want to show my power today. You go, this is going to be good. Why? Because I'm not praying out of my desire. I'm praying by his instruction because I hear his voice. I don't have to wonder if something's going to happen here. I've been instructed because something is going to happen here. But much of the church is unfamiliar with this. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10. And I want you to see this work that God has. Luke chapter 10 verse 17 is when Jesus sent out the 70 and he came, they came back. And it says in verse 17, And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devil's are subject unto us through thy name. 
And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What is he talking about? If you wield and try to wield the power of God without understanding your position in exousia, you'll be more enthralled with yourself doing what he told you to do than you will be with how the kingdom has been unfolded to you. The great thing is, is that we can get into a position where God absolutely, by his power, will work through us. But it's not our power to wield. It is his. We don't do what we want to. We listen for what we need to do. I want you to hear this. I'm going to repeat this a couple times. Presence is meant to be the place to go to learn identity. Presence is the place you go to learn your identity. Let me explain just a little bit. You, you know that Galatians 5 passage that talks about the fruit of the Spirit? If your life doesn't have the fruit of the Spirit, you don't need power. You need presence. You deal with Anger, lack of self-control. You deal with loving people and you can't stand people. You need to be in the presence of God because there needs to be a purifying of what's gonna happen there. You know there's a 24-3 prayer room over there. But I will tell you this, there are some people who because of their background or because of their lifestyle can't afford to go over there because they know that the intimacy would break them and would confront them and they don't know how to deal with that so they keep him aloof. Why? Because I haven't learned to develop the relationship of presence and I would love to wield the power of God but because I'm jaded in areas of my life, I don't understand how to come close and let him examine me and let me learn how to, how to hear his voice. I believe there are people right here, and please understand me, you're not bad people. Nobody's trying to say you're just evil. Nobody, nobody is saying that. You're just afraid. You're afraid of what you don't know. You're afraid that you're different than other people and you go, I never understood how people talk about this. I wanna tell you something. I, I get a little you know, jaded on some of these phrases that come out of churchiosity. I'm just gonna say this, okay? In my opinion, intimacy with God is not like intimacy with my wife and yet it's compared like that all the time. She's a human. I don't have to overcome obstacles with my wife. God's not human. He's not trying the kingdom of God. You may find this strange. The kingdom of God is not love. The kingdom of God is power. But he has to introduce it to humans through love because that's the language we understand. Do you understand what I just said to you? I've been studying this for two months. All of this is scripture. 
And yet what we want to do is make God all this loving God and we want to make him human and he's dying to make us God-like, spirit man. Get over our humanity. I don't need a nice little God. He needs a disciple. And you will never have apostleship until you learn discipleship. We want to get people into the church and make them included and all this kind of stuff. And I believe if the truth be known, we would be no different than Jesus. He's got 500 people out there and he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And all of them left except 12. And he said, will you also leave me? What did they say? You alone have the words of eternal life. You have already told us more than we have found at any other source. We are your disciples now. We have sat at your feet. We are convinced these are the ones who were ready for power. You might be getting more than what you bargained for. It's the word. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 10. And in verse 38, he's preaching to them, talking to this crowd that's got Pharisees in it and teachers of the law and everything. And all I want to, just for the sake of time, I'm just reading this one verse. It says, how God, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Now, do you think that God had to be anointed? Yeah, he did. Do you know what his anointing is? The Holy Spirit. Do you know what your anointing is? The Holy Spirit. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Why are they separated? Because when he was baptized, the dove came and he was filled with the Spirit. And he went filled with the Spirit into the wilderness and came out in the power of the Spirit. Because he purchased it. And then he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. I'm just going to run you through several verses, and then I'm going to make some observations. Luke chapter 24, Jesus is finishing out his work on the earth. Luke chapter 24, and you can write these down if we get there too fast, but verse 49 says this. Jesus is speaking. If you got red letters, it is. And behold, I send the promise of the Father, which means it was planned, upon you. But tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Endue means clothed upon. We have the spirit within and we have the spirit upon. The spirit within gives you exousia. The spirit upon gives you dunamis. And when you have that corporate work of God, but you're not going to be ready to have the dunamis covering until you've learned how to walk in the position and obedience to Christ. I don't care how young you get baptized, you're going to have to battle through. Jesus was 30 years old when he got baptized. Teaching at 12, baptized at 30. Is that weird? Only by church culture. Am I trying to have a reformation here? I'm not trying to do anything. All I'm trying to do is honor the word. Because if we've learned things that aren't according to the word, then we've been led into false teaching. And if I'm afraid to hear something that's in the word because of what I've been taught, then I'm in the false teaching. And I need to repent and say, God, I wasn't following your instruction. I mean, Thursday night we were talking in this room over here in River School. One of our 
People taking the class said, man, I just get so troubled with that story of Uzzah. You know who Uzzah was? I would ask for a show of hands, but I don't want to make feel bad. I didn't say an Uzi. Uzzah. More people know what an Uzi is than they know Uzzah. He was the guy that reached out to steady the ark on the cart and died on the spot. And they said, why would God do that when he's trying to do a good thing? I don't think it's that difficult to answer. You see, the whole thing was out of order. The the ark was never supposed to be on a cart. So there should have never been anybody that had to reach out their hand to steady it. But the only way that they're going to find out that it's wrong to have it in the cart is when somebody reaches out their hand and they go to steady it and they drop dead on the ground and immediately they take that thing off the cart, put it in a guy's barn over here and he's blessed for the next number of years because it's sitting in his barn and then they go back to the book of the law to try to figure out what's going on and found out in the book of the law that the thing was supposed to be carried and now they can do it right and God doesn't have to administer justice, he can administer mercy. That's the plan of God. He wants you to prosper in your life, but he's not a sugar daddy. You'll spend time at his feet and make him your teacher, or he will just say, you've got what you want from me. And if that's enough, that's good for me too. But you're never gonna enter into the place of blessing and never enter enter into that place of power unless you're gonna come and sit at my feet and learn the kingdom through me. This won't be popular, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll have our grace critics. Acts 4, 32, 33 says this. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. What do you suppose that heart and soul was? Who were these people? These are the people that heard the teachings of Christ. This is Acts chapter four, right after the day of Pentecost. These are people who have walked among the places where Jesus was. These are the people that saw the miracles. Most of them were probably fed by five loaves and two fishes. And you look at this and you're going, they've seen the power of Jesus. But the resurrection changed everything. They were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that any of their things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. We make a big mantra out of that. Listen to what it says. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. I will tell you this. The world isn't going to be impressed by our communal living. They'll be impressed when the power of God is exhibited in the lives of believers and they're going out and infecting the world instead of just in, uh, helping one another and assisting each other with the goods that we have. When it says great power was upon them and great grace was upon them, those are synonymous. The great grace is the power of God that's going to make you something that you never will be without learning the discipleship and then walking in the apostleship. The apostle simply means you're sent. When were they sent? Right after the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them at the day of Pentecost and they were his witnesses and the power of God will send you because that's what its anointing is for. Listen to this part in Acts chapter 6. They're talking about Stephen. Stephen was a special man. One of the deacons in learning. I mean, he was full of the Holy Ghost, and you could tell that he was a special man. And so if you're a special person in the kingdom of God, I can tell you this. The enemy's got a target on you. Welcome it. You think he's just going to let the power of God come through somebody with no adversarial thought? 
No, you have to welcome the target of the enemy on your back when you're going to walk in the power of the Most High because he can't allow you to gain momentum. Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, went around doing all kinds of stuff, and that's what this passage says, but I want to tell you, Nothing is different from the spirit that was in Peter and on, uh, on Stephen, in Stephen and on Stephen than it is today. Amen. Same spirit, right. same opportunity. But what we lack so much is sitting at the feet. Mm-hmm. How long did they sit at the feet of Jesus? Three years. And they still didn't believe right. on the night of the Passover and they betrayed and left and ran and felt bad and grieved. Why? Because everything we invested, it's gone. If you follow Jesus, be prepared to look like a fool. But walk out his truth. I don't have it all figured out. I'll just tell you that right now. But what I have figured out, I want to walk in. What I have observed I want to be real in my life. I don't want to just preach it. Acts 6, starting in verse 7, and the word of God increased. (laughs) Why? Because the craziness increased. Because the power was released. And when the power is released, the word of God increases because people get hungry and they want to know who you are and what you're about. You won't have to go talk to them. They'll come and ask you. That's the difference today. When you walk in the power of God, they'll want to know who you are. You won't have to figure out who they are. Definitely not saying don't go get them. Go get them. Demonstrate the power of God when you go. And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Why? The better has come. We had something, but it's not like this. We've never seen power like this. And Stephen, full of What? Faith and power. A disciple and an apostle. He knew what he was talking about, full of faith. How does faith come? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we have to hear the word of God in order that we can walk in obedience. Faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. You've got church people today going, well, that's because it was new and and God just wanted to show himself strong in that day so he could convince the people they were there. And you're going, I thought God was no respecter of persons. What happens to the rest of this story? Where does it say that he wanted to just show his power to this time and then he was gonna tell the rest of us, you don't need it? It's not in my Bible. I don't care what denomination is going to say it. Not in my Bible. Remember that Bethesda story? How many people were around that pool? It's the M word of King James. Multitude. Multitude of people around the pool of Bethesda waiting for what? The troubling of the water when an angel came down. You see, Jesus was full of exousia. He wasn't worried about his position. He came for position in this world. So when he walked up to the pool of Bethesda, he could have ordered any one of them to get up. Except he wasn't instructed to order any one of them to get up. He was ordered to one. And I want to give you an observation. He went to that man and he said, you've been here 38 years. Why didn't you get in the pool? And the man said, I don't have anybody to help me. Right? And Jesus said, well, 
why don't you just get up? This story is in John chapter 5. Because you see, I believe that Jesus recognized a demon. You say, why would you say that? I'll tell you why. I'd love to tell you. Because he said, take up your bed and walk. It was basically instruction against the thing that held him in his bed. Because right then in the same chapter, it says that Jesus saw him in the temple. And what did he say to him? He said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Well, what would a worse thing come upon him, and why would the thing have an opportunity, a worse thing come upon him if it wasn't a spirit that was on him in the first place? Because Jesus is the one that talked about if you cast out a demon and he comes back and finds that you have the place cleaned and swept, but you're not filled with another spirit, that he's going to bring seven worse than himself, and he will again inhabit the house. You see, there's going to be times when we have to understand it's not about healing. But if we don't hear, we're just going to pray for healing. And the Spirit of God might be saying, but it's not just sickness, it's a spirit. And if we don't have ears to hear, we're not going to hear that. So we're going to take authority over sickness, but we won't even know to take authority over a demon. Some of you are probably hearing some of this stuff for the very first time in your life. And I can tell you, I've never preached this message before. Not in this way. It's new. But we need to wake up. God is so ready to manifest his power in the church. But he's not going to manifest it to a bunch of people who don't have any time for him. If we can't hardly muster enough time to come to one service, then good luck to your power supply. You're not going to possess it. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That is the power of God working in weakness. I'm not going to go here, but you can look at it. Acts chapter 8 is the story of Simon the sorcerer. And he honestly was enthralled with the power that the disciples wield. I'll call them apostles now because they're wielding it in rightful ownership. And he said, this is awesome what you guys are doing. But later on he sees them praying for people and suddenly they can speak in tongues and do stuff and you're going wow so when he sees one of the other disciples he says man let me buy this gift from you he happened to say it to the wrong guy but I want you to understand what he said you basic son of the devil you think that this power is purchased with money? You want to bring the currency of this kingdom into the spirit kingdom and act like you can just transfer from one kingdom to another? Oh, no, 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 no. Your money doesn't count in the spiritual kingdom. That is a physical currency. It has zero value in the spirit kingdom. What you have to do is you have to get to know the master. And when you get to know him, he'll give you the power free, but you have to purchase it through discipleship. Does that make sense to you folks? We have become, we have become so position-minded in the church 
Everybody's a pastor. We even naming people bishops and apostles and everything else. You're going, I don't know if many of them have ever owned one position in their life. And I don't say that trying to accuse. What I'm saying is, if you can just go study and be named something, good. But the evidence is going to be, do you walk in power? Do you have the authority of the kingdom and the power of the spirit that where you go, people know that there's something coming from you that other people don't naturally possess? I want you to turn with me to Romans. Romans chapter 1. You know, when you labor this long in a message, I'm sorry, I'm not going to cut it off. We've got a few observations to make yet, like six or seven. But since you have your phones off, you have no idea what time it is. Isn't that awesome? Except for those of you who know. Paul, uh, it says in Romans 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. I'm just going to stop for a second. Called to be an apostle. What does it mean? He was called to be one of the sent out ones. But what did he do right after His conversion. Separated himself for three years and went into the wilderness. And he became so familiar with God in personality that sometime during that, and then it says that there was another 14 years where he was in the back country and he only went up to Jerusalem one time in all of that time. And there was times when he had learned how to minister the truth of God and he actually was taken out of his body and translated into heaven to see what's going on there and to get the download for the church and to do everything he needed to do. And I will tell you this, we need those people in the church today instead of prophesying what they think might happen, what they might have happened, and what the red cloud and the blue moon and the black sky are saying to us. Instead, they need the word of the Lord, and when we hear it, we'll fasten ourselves to it, but it will come across as the word of the Lord and not some nice thing about a man. We've got so many people talking so many strange things, and who are you gonna believe then? I don't believe any of them. Why? Because they discredit one another. Well, when you can't believe anybody, where are you going to go? Back to presence. I don't have to know all those things. It'd be great to. I don't have to know those things. I already know what he wants me to do. Bring souls into the kingdom. If I'm so into self-preservation that I'm more worried about the end of time than I am about the end of their life, then I don't have the fruit of the Spirit. I'm just asking. Does that make sense to you? I don't get great joy out of confronting church, but the truth is I'm not. The Word is. Separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in holy scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's, that's, that's such a mouthful. But do you realize what the resurrection is? We're getting ready to come into Easter, which we should call Resurrection Sunday. And by the way, we don't know when it was, okay? So it's not like, you know, April's a big deal. We just like to celebrate the great things of God. 
So don't make a big deal out of it. And we're not celebrating Ishtar and all the junk that goes with it. I hope you're not. But he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In other words, Jesus died for sins. That's what the cross was for. But the spirit of God, who is the witness to the word of God, had to inspect Jesus for anything that would be marked by sin. But he had already had Pilate declare that the lamb was spotless. And when the spirit inspected him and said, no fault here, then the spirit of holiness says, he didn't have the right to die. So therefore, I will raise him back to life because you didn't have the right to kill him. And so now, by the blood that was shed that was innocent, he undoes sin forever. But by the power of the resurrection, he now cursed his own power because anybody that's declared innocent can now be risen from the dead because sin can't hold them. And now we are declared innocent by the blood of the lamb. And when he says so, we will rise from our death into new life and it, it, there's no hold there will be declared to be the children of God by the power of the spirit in the resurrection of the dead it's a principle it's not well I hope if you can walk in presence you're going to know same chapter verse 16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the demonstration of the power of God unto all the way to true salvation. That's sight. It is the demonstration of the power of God. I want you to think about this, guys. That's not a light verse. The power of God is going to come into me and upon me and it's going to cause me, a natural human being, to be supernaturally infused with the power of God so that I don't have to live in sin but I can overcome sin by the power of the Spirit and He has enough power that He can walk me all the way through this life unto my salvation. That's not natural. The natural thing is to sin. The supernatural work is, I don't need to. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. This is a paramount one. This will help you understand what I said a little while ago. Paul is rebuking some of the Corinthian people. And he says, now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly if God wills and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Let me explain that to you. God is power, dunamis, power. But the only way that he can transfer that power to us is by telling us how it works. So to him, the word is not necessary. The word is necessary for him to communicate how the kingdom of God, which is power, can work here, but if we don't get that instruction, we don't cooperate. What he's trying to do is get the power of that kingdom into this kingdom, but we can't know that unless it comes through word. So the word isn't for him, the word is for us because the word is the communication necessary for me to know how that kingdom works and I can have that in me and upon me and that kingdom will work in me. 
Does that make sense to you guys? You see, I, I believe that we approach the kingdom of God with such humanistic ideas that we want to almost make God human instead of him making us spirit beings that are not struggling with our identity. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am a new creation in him. He has given me the divine nature of the Holy Spirit. And that's who I am. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says about me because that's my identity and I know that it's been purchased. And I want you to own it the same way too. I want you to own it because if you can own it from the days that you're in right there, the world's not ready for you. God wants to demonstrate his power. But if we're like the 70 that come back and go, man, God, you should have seen us. We were awesome. And he goes, I saw Satan say the same thing. Don't marvel in your authority. You bought that with position with me. Marvel that I have included you in the kingdom. Don't ever forget your position because that's the only thing that allows you the power. I know this is coming like a fire hose. I will soon, soon turn that off and you can swallow. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter four, just, just listen to this. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of him and not of me. Do you see that in position? I have to learn how to make sure that every time power is used in my life, that the excellency and the glory that comes from it is not consumed at all by me. It's all him, and it's only by him and for him and through him that any of us participate. One more, two more. Good, thank you. Second Corinthians chapter 12. You know what this is? That controversial thorn in the flesh. I don't even understand why there's controversy. I really don't. People want to label it persecution. Well, why would his thorn in the flesh then be different than yours? In this life, you're going to have trouble. Blessed are they which are persecuted. Evidently, Paul wasn't the only one. And I don't believe it was in his spirit. I believe it was in his flesh, since that's what it says. And it says in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord three times, thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. In other words, my, the strength that I'm going to give you is on purpose to get you through it. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore... Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God, of Christ, may rest upon me? What was the thorn for? So that he wouldn't be exalted above measure. So that he wouldn't get out of position. Is that accurate? So therefore... When he understands the kingdom, we have to be brought low so that we can be used highly. We have to be humbled and abased so that the power of God will be pure coming through us. And when I see what he says there, 
I will gl glory in my weakness. That's what infirmities are. Weakness of any kind. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. If this is my purchase, then I say, I buy. That's what it says to me. Two passages out of Timothy real quick. We love 2 Timothy 1.7. You want to sing it together? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a... Good chorus. <laughs> that power? What is it? Anybody want to look it up in Greek? It's the kingdom of dunamis. He has not given us the spirit of fear. He has shared with us the essence of his kingdom, which is supernatural power, supernatural love, and supernatural understanding. That's what it says. So why should we try to operate in the natural? And if he hasn't given us the spirit of fear, you know what fear is? Some of you listen to Christian radio. Fear is a liar. That's a good word. It's true. What is a lie? The opposite of truth. So we should reject every fear because fear is never the truth. You can know circumstances and not fear. You can get a report and not fear. Because if you can become like Paul and you can say, hey, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? Better. Better. Our problem is we have it so nice we don't want to die. If we were in a different country, we'd say, kill me now. I'm serious. We, it's just that we have so much. We don't want to give it up. And yet streets of gold, come on now. A mind that is unhindered. Supernatural mind. And perfect presence with sight. Why do you think it says that those who he's really going to come for is those who love his appearing? Because they want to get out of here. And if I love this so much, I'm not wanting to get out of here. I need presence. Second Timothy chapter 3 gives you a list of things. In the last days, know this, that perilous times will come. We're there. And you know what it says? You do. It says that they will have a facsimile. They will have a form. They will have a look-alike of godliness. But deny what? What's the word? Dunamis. And when you deny dunamis, you're actually denying the kingdom because the kingdom of God is dunamis. It just took the word of God to get it to us. Does that make sense to you? He did us a favor by putting it in word. He could have just demonstrated power. That's the same voice that spoke creation, but he wrote it down so that we could possess it. 
And yet there's going to be people who have a form of saying they love God, but they're going, well, I just don't know about this dunamis thing. Well, the Spirit of God's going to say, I know about you. If you deny the power, you're denying the essence of the kingdom. And if you're from the backgrounds that do that, just know you need to get out of that and change your, get your mindset changed. Because the kingdom of God is power. It's not just word. It's power. And when the power of God has come so that we can be the express image of Christ and operate in it among anybody that he tells us to, then we're going to walk somewhere. Let's stand together. I'm going to do something that I felt like we were supposed to do. Okay? I got it over there on the other side. I love singing when the word has come forth. Because in the, in the beginning of the service, it's like the, the singing opens us up. But afterward, in my opinion, which is just one of a couple hundred here today, when you sing afterward, it's almost like it becomes cement. And it fills in there and it lodges and says, fastened. There was a song, old song. Amen. <laughs> Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the We love you, we worship and adore you, glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name, Thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you. And glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. Do you realize what you're just saying? We love you, and we're going to glorify your name in all the earth. Now, you can't just say that and not do it, or you're a liar. 
And there's been enough liars. I want to pray for you. Father, thank you that your word is perfect. Converting the soul. God, I want my soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions. I want them healed by the word of God. I want the authority of the word of God to refashion my soul so that there is no place for fear because I can't lose. I want the spirit of power to rest upon each one of us, God. But I pray, oh, Father, that we would pursue discipleship so that we don't have to wonder if we can walk in apostleship. I pray, oh, God, that through this time and through this prayer season, God, that there would be such a work of your ministry of the spirit that it would open our ears again to hear you speak clearly to us in the instruction of what purpose and what task you have in front of us. God, let us look at people in a new way, not because we are doing something, but because we are yielding to your spirit and to your voice, and we see things we haven't seen before, and you show us people, and you show us things, circumstances, and we would have no way of knowing except that the power of the spirit is now resting upon us. God, I pray that in this house today, that's been bathed in prayer and allows in this atmosphere, oh God, for a word to come forth and for worship to take place so that your name can be glorified, but also that we will be refreshed and encouraged to do the work of Christ in these last days. And may you, oh God, receive every bit of the glory and the honor and the power is yours. And so God, we say thank you, thank you, thank you because you've shared it with us. We have no right to it except that you have included us in. Thank you for taking care of our sin that the power of God may rest upon us. But may we also not resist the necessary suffering that many times purchases the power's work. And I pray God for anyone who's here that maybe has never walked in the beauty of who you are. They don't understand even what we're talking about. But there's something drawing their heart. I pray, God, let the conviction of your Holy Spirit so rest in them that they know they'll never be the same. Draw them by your Spirit into a life change and a surrender to the one who just wants us to hand over the reins and say, yes, Father. God, I thank you for the work you're doing in us and around us. God, let it be multiplied. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Can we just do one thing before we go? Can we sing that last verse again? I just can't quit. Spirit, we love you. We worship and adore. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify. here.